Welcome to Inside, today produced in partnership between Alaska Public Media and M. Oppenheim TV. Today we're chatting with Diane Kaplan, President and CEO of the Rasmussen Foundation, one of the largest family foundations in the Pacific Northwest. The foundation's mission is to be a catalyst to promote a better life for Alaskans, and Diane has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Diane, for joining us today. My pleasure, Mark. One of the things that I find interesting is that when you go back into history, you have so many themes that, that still today are, uh, are resonant in the Foundation's work. You have the, um, the, the cross-cultural uh, involvement. You have the respect that, that comes from that. You have pursuing business in a hard scrabble environment and making it successful and then giving back. And, and all those themes are part of your culture today as a foundation. It, it comes from a family, it comes from an involvement with the community, and it comes from a, a very hard-nosed idea of, of how investment ought to resonate and, and be effective for the community itself. Well, the early values of the foundation are very much in play today. Of course, they are carried out in a different way. But for example, uh, if we for whatever reason only had $100 left, I'm sure it would go to a food bank or to a shelter. Um, helping people who need a hand up is definitely part of the culture of the foundation. At the same time, a lot of our work is strategic and when we operate and make a big investment, we operate very much like bankers. We'll look somebody in the eye, face to face, always, and we make a judgment. If we make a grant to this person, are they going to pay back? Now, in the case of a banking loan, it's pay back the money that you loan them with interest. In the case of Rasmussen Foundation is, will you pay back with social capital? For us, we very much believe in meeting small needs as they come across because Alaskan organizations have few places to go. And a lot of those things are not very sexy. You know, fixing your roof, or buying a new copy machine are not terrifically sexy to most funders. They're very sexy to us. So we do three million dollars worth of small grants every year. It's a couple of hundred. Almost no other foundation our size does any small grants. It's just too um, labor intensive and usually there are other funders within their region or in their discipline that do that kind of funding, but we don't have that here. A number of years ago, we learned that Alaska, among the 50 states, had the lowest level of charitable giving for people who are on the wealthy side of the scale. So people who are low income, people who are middle income, gave about average compared to people in the other states, but our wealthy Alaskans were not giving to charities the way their peers did in other states. And there are all kinds of theories about that. It could be they didn't really expect their kids and grandkids to be here in a hundred years. It could be there weren't vehicles to do that. For example, community foundations have been well established in the rest of the country. There are some that are celebrating their hundredth anniversary. We haven't had that history in the state. It could be they're giving a lot of money to politics and not to that, whatever it might be. We decided there was a role for us as other fa private foundations have done around the country to stimulate private giving, individual giving in our state by using the Rasmussen family as a model about what you could do. So that's taken uh, several different tacks. One is creating uh, an initiative, we call it the Community Asset Building Initiative. And through that, nine new community foundations have been established. We provided matching grants, technical support, and built up our statewide Alaska Community Foundation to be the back office for all of those. And we've had great assistance from way back when, when we first started studying this from the Kellogg Foundation, the Mott Foundation, the Lilly Foundation, the Ford Foundation, who had all done similar efforts, whether in Indiana or Michigan or in Nebraska or London, and learned and said, how would you do this? If you were gonna start all over and do this, how would you do it? and we had a great group of people who advised us and it's gone really well and we're starting to see those first really big gifts to these community funds. At the same time, each of us gets a permanent fund dividend every year. This year is about $2,000 per Alaskan. 
we initiated a piece of legislation to allow Alaskans to donate all or part of their dividend to the charity of their choice. So the Pick, Click, Give campaign right now is underway. We uh, invest in a Pick, Click, Give manager with many of our funder partners here in Alaska. Uh, we do media. We do a lot of social media. I was just on the teleconference with our my colleague at the Alaska Community Foundation. And it raises about $3 million a year now from about 30,000 Alaskans, many of whom are making their very first gift to that organization. In terms of, of the larger initiatives that you have uh, going forward, could you describe some of those and, and talk about uh, what will be important to the foundation over the next three to five years? Our biggest initiative at the moment is around the current situation with the imbalance in Alaska's budget. And this is brand new territory for us. Our state has a $5.2 billion budget and we have a $3.8 billion deficit and right with, now. And with the oil revenues being so heavily impacted, uh, this problem will persist into 2017 and perhaps even into 2018. So this is a very, very serious time in Alaska's financial history. It's a very uh, urgent time in our state. Even if the price of oil went up to $100 a barrel tomorrow, we would still have a fiscal gap. So we can no longer operate with a single source of revenue. And it's time that we have to talk about broad-based taxes, income taxes, sales taxes, corporate taxes, changing the way we use our endowment and it's a difficult conversation. We also have to talk about, is our budget the right size for the 700 and something thousand people that we have here? And most people say, no, it's too big, and we're going to have to reduce it to a sustainable level. But how do you do that? You want to do it in a thoughtful way and have the minimum impact. If we go back to our mission of Rasmussen Foundation, which is to be a catalyst for a better life for Alaskans, this effort is very much aligned with our values and our roots and our mission. And we look at this as what will it take, what types of decisions do we need to make to ensure a healthy, happy environment for Alaskans going forward. Right now what we're starting to see is companies are starting to lay off employees. Hours are being cut. People are worried about their jobs. We see more for sale signs. We can see all right. the signs that we saw in the last recession here. Nobody wants to go through that again. So and it's time for action. And that's what Alaskans are saying. They're telling their elected officials, we want to see some budget cuts, uh, but we don't want to reduce our quality of life. We want to come up with a sustainable budget that will provide us with a good future for our kids and our grandkids, and we are willing to participate by looking at new revenue sources for our state. So this is the kind of, of solution set that bridges the traditional conservative, liberal, left, right, Republican, Democrat, whatever you want to call it, um, divides, because this issue is definitely not going to be solved by taxes. And this issue is definitely not going to be solved by budget cuts. And this issue is definitely not going to be solved by the price of oil jumping from where it is today, which is in the 30s, I think, hopefully, and, you know, up to 100. There are no, there, there's no one solution. This is the kind of situation where, as a community, the whole community needs to start thinking seriously of what balance is going to be struck, and it will be a balance. Nobody is going to have a single solution or, or find some white knight that comes in and, and, and fixes everything. There's no silver bullet here. We feel, wouldn't it be great if Alaska could be a model for the rest of the United States on what civility looks like in political discourse? in terms of bipartisan solutions to pressing problems of the day. We would love to see that, our state model, what that looks like for the rest of the country. In terms of, of how you see this, this play out over the next uh, years, will the, will the organization need to shift a bit, uh, placing perhaps more emphasis on communication um, in, in a broader sense, rather than thinking about communication in terms of grant making? but also think about communications in terms of, of this other 
uh, dialogue, which is, a, which is the full dialogue about how do you keep Alaska strong beyond the idea of, of, of making grants and making mm -hmm. strategic investments. We have several uh, initiatives that have been ongoing and a couple of new things. We, on a s subject matter basis, we will not be with this fiscal project forever. This is right. a, a short-term project. But for example, we're working on reducing the harm caused by alcohol in our state. We have devastating impacts in our state of people drinking too much. It's not about teetotaling. It's not about um, telling people what they should or shouldn't do. But when people drink too much, they do stupid things. And the results are we have the highest rate of children in state custody, domestic violence, um, homicides of domestic partners, and so on. And we believe if we can get a handle on alcohol, all of those other indicators will be positively affected. On the other hand, we have a, a housing situation that um, is very dire in certain places in the state. That's something where you can put a very specific strategy together for a few years and hopefully have a big impact and move on to some other needs in the state. So we have some long games and short games and, uh, and then we have our regular bread and butter capital program, uh, big and small capital items. With the change in the economy and even with the national economy, we don't have a lot of sources of capital money coming into the state anymore. A lot of the federal programs have been reduced. There are no more earmarks. We used to be a very big recipient of earmarks from the federal government. Since a lot of our money has gone into capital, we're having to really change our business plan and look at new ways of accomplishing our mission that don't necessarily involve a lot of bricks and mortar in the future. So you have a, a series of initiatives that are about keeping Alaska strong for the next several years. You have some long-standing initiatives that are, are, are about uh, a balance between short-term response, uh, large strategic investments, and uh, small capital projects. And then you also have these, uh, these investments in, in great social movements. Um, this is just a, a, an amazing series of approaches, very textured, very specific, and as you said, very personal. Diane Kaplan, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us of the Rasmussen Foundation, and thank you so much for your insight. You're welcome. Thank you, Mark. Welcome to Insight. Today produced in partnership between Alaska Public Media and um, Oppenheim TV. We are chatting with Kirk Rose, Executive Director of the Anchorage Community Land Trust, which is formed to develop healthy and prosperous communities in Anchorage. Kirk has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Kirk, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So you have a very unique institution. You are, on the one hand, a land trust, you're also a community development organization, so you are also a developer. Talk about how you bridge these two different interests in a way that, that supports the entire community. Well, first and foremost, we're responsible to and accountable to the communities within which in, uh, we work. In our case, it's primarily focused on Mountain View, which is Anchorage's lowest income area. Uh, it's an area of concentrated poverty area median income in Mountain View is about $37,000 per household. Uh, for, for context there, Anchorage wide uh, average median income is about $78,000 per household. So you can see the disparity and the divide. We work in two different uh, areas as you mentioned, real estate and community development work. Areas of concentrated poverty in our urban cities across the country have big, big challenges and that's why the Anchorage Community Land Trust was formed. Talk about the, uh, the diversity that is part of the Mountain View landscape. Mountain View is one of the most diverse uh, footprints in the United States. Per capita, the uh, representation of ethnicities, cultures, and nation states from around the world is higher than anywhere else. 
what makes our work so fascinating and, and interesting is, is that partnership with the community and having the world come to America to the, for the first time, not just to Anchorage, not just to Alaska, but to, to Mountain View. As you approach this, what are the hallmarks? Yeah. How do you communicate the kind of respect and consideration? How do you get the input from the community that is respectful but also is operationally yeah. expedient because yeah. you can't just endlessly consult. You actually have to get something done at the end of the year. Well, you're, you're taking the test for me in a lot of ways, but respect and consideration are, are two huge values of ours. I think the last piece of it and, and is, is a value of harmony. Excuse me, that's not the last piece. Harmony is, is another big piece. Uh, but then there's one defining thing that we go back to all the time. And it's so simple, it's fun. People show up to things that are fun. And uh, in our community development work and in community development work across the nation, there's important things that happen in basement meetings at churches. And there's important advocacy work that you have to do where you have to go to uh, city assembly meetings and sit there for six hours. And there's people who are built to do that. Uh, and they're powerful community champions. But we take the different spin, which is if we can make this thing fun, I can get 4,000 people to show up to the Mountain View Street Fair where there's music and dancing. And then I can ask them about how their health is, how their community is working for them, if they're able to get a job. If I'm just sitting there and asking them to come to another community meeting, I'll get the 20 people that we always get. So we take that one little spin of the model and we say, how can we make this fun? Everything that we do. How can we invite more people to be involved? And, and fun is our defining factor. Everything that we do is a vehicle to learn more about Mountain View. Whether it's a farmer's market, whether it's a street fair, uh, whether it's talking about public transportation, the more that we can celebrate collectively the work that we're doing, people show up for that. Mm -hmm. We like to serve cake because people want to show up and eat cake. We like to have parties where there's ice cream and popcorn because that's fun for people to show up to. And then we can engage them in the end. But first we have to say, look what we've all accomplished together. There's a decade of work to celebrate in the community. What is your budget? Uh, my budget this year is, uh, I'm going to spend about $1.5 million. Um, I'm fortunate to have grants from the state of Alaska, from the Rasmussen Foundation, from other big philanthropic partners in Alaska. Uh, that really pokes at the real estate side of what we do. Anchorage Community Land Trust has been a transformational partner and a driving force in Mountain View reinvestment. The Mountain View Service Center, for example, is a 55,000 square foot building that we own and manage, which houses some of the state's and city's uh, best and most important nonprofits. We worked with Credit Union One to bring the first financial institution to the neighborhood in 20 years. Uh, we're bringing it was really a financial desert, wasn't it? Mountain View has been socioeconomically isolated. Um, the perception that we're changing, or the idea that we brought was, imagine Mountain View, a capitalized Mountain View. Imagine people who can have access to car loans, who can pay their bills at the telephone communication store that's right in their neighborhood. Or build a business. Or build, start a business, choose to stay. Um, for a long time, that's been the rallying cry of Mountain View revitalization, is we want to be a community of choice, a place where people can choose to stay, choose to work, choose to play. Again, I can't stress enough the importance of communicating with the community, uh, talking with the community, dialoguing with the community, asking about these needs and challenges. Uh, in 2012, we organized the Mountain View Community Summit to be sure we had that pulse of the community. 200 people came over two days to interact and talk with their neighbors about what they wanted to see their community become. Uh, when we were developing the Mountain View Neighborhood Plan, we talked with one in every seven people, uh, 1,000 out of about the 7,000 people in Mountain View about what they wanted to see for the future of their community. And they identified two things primarily. That Mountain View is a health desert now. Uh, the, the intervention of the health community has not arrived. Uh, at so there are no clinics? There will be a clinic, so that's my, my next ah, big milestone. There, we go. there is going to be a clinic. Alaska Regional Hospital is opening up uh, their Mountain View Community Clinic, and it should open later this summer. The other big challenge that was identified was unemployment. Mountain View still has a 22% unemployment rate. I talk about it in terms of literacy. Uh, people typically know at this point what the, the idea behind financial literacy, for example. Uh, 
being initiated into how credit works in this country. Right. Well, there's workforce literacy as well. And when you put that with the diversity in our community, uh, there's social literacy around how you apply for jobs, what resumes look like. How you communicate. How you communicate. Showing up on time, how you dress. Access to technology is another big one. Um, uh, and, and I think there's another important piece that the conversation is just starting in Anchorage around workforce credentialing. So if I was an engineer in my home country in Africa and I come to Anchorage and the only careers that are available for me, if that, all of that skill set doesn't transfer, then I get a position that uh, maybe I can't pay for my family's rent. Where in Africa, I had a different social experience. I had my education translated in a different way. And Anchorage is really starting to question uh, what we're calling brain waste. That's all of these people uh, who bring these skill sets who aren't able to apply them when they arrive in our city. How do you approach that as a practical matter? It's, it, it's all well and good to have a conversation. Yeah. But when you have people who are credentialed in certain ways yeah. and they have, they have found no outlet for those, uh, those competencies, yeah. Um, how, in a practical way, can you create the opportunity for that person to have their skills utilized? Is, is part of the issue thinking about the, the idea of, of how a virtual workforce can be uh, leveraged? Is it partly trying to attract uh, businesses into those areas? Are there issues with how a individual might communicate mm -hmm. their competencies mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. a um, to somebody seeking yeah. an employee? Yeah. Economic development, uh, businesses locating in areas, uh, people living and working in the same place, public transportation, being sure that people can get to the job centers that Anchorage has, which are downtown and midtown. Mm -hmm. um, there's a role for resource deployment. How do we bring uh, our job training centers into Mountain View? How do we be sure that they're robust and responsive to the needs of the community? There's also different things that our city could be doing. There's public contracting that's being done in places like Seattle and San Francisco where you're hiring minority or uh, women business owners um, and they're giving priority in contracting to the city. I know that Anchorage is looking at those models. Uh, and then we've got we've to uh, bolster that person and help them be the entrepreneur that they want to be. Uh, and that's training and resources and, and, and access to capital. So. In part, there is a private response, there's a public response, there's a question of logistics, there's a question of, of how do you create the glue to keep this, the, this community together, but yeah. also this community starting to contribute yep. as an economic engine for um, other interests. So yeah. you have a dialogue as opposed to a monologue. Yeah, and you know, this isn't just Kirk on the phone. This is building structure within the uh, Community and Economic Development Office of the Municipality of Anchorage. It's building structure in the state of Alaska Department of Labor and Workforce Development. It's asking our business community to respond to this critical need. And, and I, I also am supported by a team of incredible people. And we try to build an organization that is full of leaders um, so that our organization, our company, Mountain View, is better when uh, it's not just, when we're creating a movement, when we're creating a movement that's addressing workforce credentialing, when we're creating a movement that is addressing Mountain View's stark unemployment compared to the rest of the city. Do you have objectives that you wish to achieve for Mountain View and indicators of success uh, in the city to show that you and your, your volunteers, your board, yeah. your partners, yeah. your staff is being successful? Absolutely. Um, Talk about those. Yeah. And I'll, I'll and I and I'll qualify it because it's it's a challenge in our community development industry because mm -hmm. these are thirty year plans they're fifty year plans the revitalization of Baltimore is uh, is a hundred a hundred years old at this point you know if you could look at it from that scope uh, so we have to be able to track we have to be able to measure we have to have smart goals um, my top five priorities are uh, Mountain View health and wellness. Okay. Expanding ACLT's goals or, or scope to other neighborhoods so that we add value in other parts of town. I'm going to forget about three of them now. Uh, diversifying our income streams, having optimizing our asset management, and um, 
developing a property that is long overdue. For Mountain View, the goals have been defined by the community. Uh, through our neighborhood planning process, uh, there's seven different, um, and I won't try to name them, uh, <laughs> there's seven specific areas of focus. Community safety, community harmony, a vibrant uh, commercial corridor, revitalized housing stock are just a few of them. And we have very specific targets under each that we measure ourselves with. That being said, for us to be most effective and responsive, we have to evolve with the community. And we're constantly assessing and measuring where we are in conjunction with where Mountain View is. Because as soon as Mountain View has a health clinic, that changes the landscape for the entire community. I love to see an organization with such a clearly defined mission of service, serving your community, making people happy, bringing joy to, to people, bringing financial services to a community, bringing healthcare services to a community, uh, education, economic opportunity. Uh, Kirk Rose, thank you so much for sharing the work that you do yeah. at the Anchorage Community Land Trust, and thank you so much for your insights. It's my pleasure, thank you.